Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this lesson off from the Oratory Place of Prayer book. Uh, we'll start with the Act of Faith, which is on page 23. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man and died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches because you have revealed them. In this faith, I desire to live and die. Amen. Uh, the reading uh, for this lesson is um, from Mark's Gospel, uh, Mark chapter 10. And uh, it's when James and John ask Jesus to sit at his right and his left. Um, this is the Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. He replied, What do you wish me to do for you? They answered, Grant that in your glory we may sit, one at your right and the other at your left. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, We can. Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or my left is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at James and John. Jesus summoned them and said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones make their authority over them felt. But it shall not be so among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you will be your servant, Whoever wishes to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In this uh, Gospel, I think it's important to, to first um, kind of realize that the word baptism here in Greek actually is, is um, or the Greek word for baptism rather, is uh, immersion. Um, so to be immersed. <clears throat> and we still use this uh, language in our culture. Uh, when you say that someone is immersed in their work or someone is immersed in uh, maybe a sporting event, uh, they're completely 100% in. They're, they're, um, they're focused, they're dedicated um, to this. And this is actually, you know, what, what, when we mean baptism, you know, baptism is an immersion, you know. Um, now, it doesn't have to be an immersion into the water, but a pouring of the water is also valid. Um, but either way, it's an immersion into the life of Christ. When we're baptized, we put on Christ. Um, a great way to, um, that this is seen in the liturgy is when uh, at <clears throat> just uh, at, the, at the offering of the gifts or when the gifts are on the altar, um, the priest will take a, a little drop of water and that drop of water will be um, dropped into the wine, the chalice. And at this time, you know, transubstantiation has an effect. Uh, hasn't happened yet. It's just water and wine. But that that little drop of water is completely immersed into the wine. And so what happens is you can't distinguish between the water and the wine at that point. They completely mix. Um, and that water represents our humanity being immersed into the divinity of Christ. Um, so you could say, well, Jesus, <clears throat> who is divine. The, the divinity immersed himself into humanity. Um, God clothed himself with humanity so that humanity could immerse himself into God. So divine, the divinity, God immersed himself into man so that man could immerse himself into God. So what we do by baptism is we choose to be immersed into the divine life. We choose to um, <clears throat> to take on uh, Christ to put on Christ and to be immersed with him to be baptized and then this leads into well, what does that mean? Um, to our life it means that we should wholeheartedly Drink the cup and I love with James and John especially one thing that stands out to me in this gospel is Jesus asked them can you drink the cup that I will drink 
And they, with great confidence, say, we can do it. Like, we can. Um, <clears throat> and I think we all need to have, as a Christian, we have committed to that. Through our baptism, now, if we remember the gospel from last week, um, with, the, with the camel and the eye of the needle, Jesus, you know, clearly says, you know, for God, all things are possible. For man, um, it, things are impossible. But for God, uh, all things are possible. And that's also true with this gospel today. To, to drink the cup that Jesus will drink is impossible for man to do alone. But with grace, with God, this becomes possible. Um, so, <clears throat> another thing um, that uh, Father Smith here at our parish said during his homily is uh, he talked about the immersion and, and, and that word, that, that baptism, uh, that word in Greek. But he also talked about the cup being really the will of God for us. And when Jesus says, I will drink the cup, it, it is saying, I will do the will of God. Will you also drink the cup? Will you also do the will of God? So if we think of a cup here, you know, I'll just draw, draw a cup here. Um, when we look at this, uh, this is really the question that we have. Will we drink from this cup? This cup is God's will for our life. And there, for the Christian, there is no, um, there's no question on whether we should do this. This is not a debate. We are called to do the will of the Father, um, just as, as Jesus did the will of the Father. Um, and, and so with this, there's no question on whether we should pick up this cup. We do pick up the cup. And like James and, and John said, we can. We can drink from this. Um, the question is, what will this cup be filled with? And if you think of wine for a second, there are different types of wine. Um, you know, there, there are uh, darker wines, there are lighter wines, there are bitter wines, and there's sweet wines. And everyone kind of has a different taste that they like in regards to wine. Um, we, we don't have a say on what our cup will be filled with. Our Lord, in His wisdom, you know, God, His will, we do His will, you know, we decide to do His will, but we can't decide what that will be. Um, so we say, I will drink from the cup, but I don't get to decide what is put in the cup. And we, we say in the morning offering, a beautiful prayer in the church, we say that I offer you all the prayers, works, joys, and sufferings that I will have this day. So we look just at something as simple as that. Our prayer, our work, our joy, and our suffering. These are some of the things that are put in our cup. And, and we say, I offer you all of that, God. Um, whatever it is that you put in my cup today, I will accept it. I will drink it. Um, there may be some times in our life, I'm looking even at my own life, there were some times in my life where I was more prayerful. Um, God was asking me to be more prayerful, uh, maybe dedicating more time to prayer. Um, now in my life, you know, I may have more duties and so maybe more work is being put into my cup. Um, maybe at times more prayer is being put into my cup. Um, you know, we may think sometimes that joy, oh, I would love to have joy in this cup. Lord, why can't you give me more joy? But this becomes difficult too, because sometimes people don't know what to do with joy. And so our Lord gives them joy, and they don't know how to carry that. They don't know how to accept that. Um, you know, something that we think would be a great event, like winning the lottery. Um, I, met, I met a family that they, they did win. They won a million dollars in the lottery, and it ruined their family. So we have to say, when I accept God's will, whatever is going to be put in here, prayer, work, joy, or suffering, Lord, I still want to hold that cup. No matter what is in that cup, I know that that is of you, and I know that you will fill this cup, and I accept whatever it is that you give me. Um, so it's, it's important that we realize that, that this, is, this cup, and holding on to this cup, is the one thing necessary. This is what we don't let go of. Uh, when our Lord speaks to, to Mary and Martha, <clears throat> um, He says that Mary has chosen the one thing necessary, and it won't be taken from her. When we as a Christian choose to do the will of God, when we choose to hold this cup, the cup will not be taken from us. We don't get to determine what's in the cup, but we hold the cup. 
If there's an abundant, if there's sorrow that is poured in the cup, we still hold the cup. If there's a lot of joy, we still hold the cup. Work, prayer, whatever is put in that cup, we know that within this is God's holy will, and we drink from the cup of His will. Um, now, this is a, a very difficult thing to do, and 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 a man alone cannot do the will of God. We must have God's help in doing His will. Um, when He asks us to do something, when He asks us to do His will, He gives us every necessary tool and grace necessary to do it. Um, again, this is why baptism is so important. At baptism, we're given the, the three theological gifts, our virtues, um, faith, hope, and love. So faith is the base of this cup. The stem is hope, and the actual, uh, I guess, the, the, the actual bowl, I guess, of, the, of the, the top here is charity, or what we call love. So we have faith, <coughs> hope, and love. And, and these are what help us to accomplish the will of God. These are graces that allow us to do God's work. Um, faith, faith is real important, and it's important that we get the definition right. Um, faith is, is believing um, that what has been revealed um, by God is actually true. Um, so I want to go back to the act of faith, which we prayed. Um, and in that act of faith, which we prayed at the beginning of this lesson, I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches, because you have revealed them. So where do we get truth? Faith is believing in truth. Where do we get the truth? We get the truth um, because God has revealed it. Jesus Christ is God, so we get this from the words of Jesus, the gospel, and then it's the church that faithfully hands this teaching on. So there is no question about truth. Truth is not relative, truth is absolute, and truth can be found. We don't need to have a discussion group, we don't need to have a committee to decide what is true. Um, how do we find what is true? We go to the gospel, and we go to what the church has consistently um, interpreted that gospel to be. And that's our faith. That becomes our base. Now, if, if, you, um, if this is lacking... If, if we don't have this base of truth, if we don't feel that truth is, is solid, um, sure, and, and, and um, absolute, then of course you can imagine what will happen to this cup. It'll just fall over. Um, and so you can, you can see the problem here if, if we don't have faith. And if we don't believe that truth is actually revealed by God, it's not uh, decided by a vote, and it's not decided by me subjectively, it is an objective truth. Um, the, next, the next one is hope. And hope really has to do with our desire. For eternal life. And the grace necessary to get there. And this eternal life is not something that's just for um, heaven. Eternal life actually begins now. One of the things also that we partake in, it says in Scripture that we are partakers of the divine life. Um, Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Um, you know, even in the Psalms it says, I must be eternal. To, to finish, I must be eternal like you. So this desire for eternal life is not just a... Um, a, a remote desire for heaven, that one day I will be there. It, it actually, hope, the virtue of hope, is a desire for to spend all eternity with God, but to have that divine life um, in my soul now, and to never give that divine life up through mortal sin. Um, so this desire is important. We kind of connect the word desire with hope, and the word truth with faith. And you can then begin to see how important this is. Not only do I have to hold strong to truth, but I also have to keep a desire. I have to keep a focus on, on what my goal is, um, which is God. Um, and, then, and then we have charity or love. And what is that? But it's love of God 
and love of neighbor because of God. Because even when I don't feel like loving my neighbor, I love my neighbor anyways out of my love for God. Um, at any one point, if I lose, we talked about if I lose this idea of truth, um, and which is actually not an idea but a person, um, Jesus Christ, if I don't have that solid ground of truth, this cup falls. If I don't have hope, it's kind of cut right here in the middle, and it again falls. And then we think, well, what, what happens if I lack charity? Um, if I don't want to love my neighbor, I don't want to love God, then there's kind of holes in the bowl here. There's holes, and that wine spills over. Um, so, so I'm not able to carry. It's my obligation to, one, do God's will, which is to carry this chalice or this cup, but it's also in it I have to be willing to carry everything that God gives me. Whatever He gives me, the joys, you know, the, the suffering, the work, the prayer, whatever our Lord places in this cup, I have to be willing to support those things. And, and how am I going to do that? Let's say that, uh, for instance, you know, something very difficult happens in my life. A great suffering comes upon my life and my family. How is it that I'm going to be able to carry that? I can only carry that with a strong faith, knowing the truth, with the desire, right, uh, to keep eternal life and to have eternal life, and love. If there's a great joy that is given to me, how am I going to be able to express that joy and show that joy to others? It's only going to be through faith, hope, and love. Um, so it, it is these virtues that enable us to actually do the holy will of God. Um, we see in 1 Corinthians, this is a pretty famous verse, uh, a lot of times it's read at weddings, we see um, 1 Corinthians 13.13, 13. this is the one on love. Love is patient, love is kind, but at the very end, um, I'm going to start reading at 12, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 13.12, St. Uh, Saint Paul says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. I think that's a great, um, great, great phrase there. Then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So God fully understands us, even when we, um, he, we are fully understood, even though he, we don't fully understand him yet. Um, with this also, we see the idea that eternal life is now. For now, we see in a mirror dimly what then we will see face to face. So the eternal life is not foreign to us. It's just very dim to us right now. And later it will be very clear face to face. Um, now we only have a part of that. A lot of that is because of our sin and the damages due to sin and in our attachments to the world. Um, but then it will be fully understood. Um, and, then, and then the last part, 1313, 13, So faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. And there's a reason for that. If, if we think about what really takes place on earth, of course all three of these. But two of these will not be in heaven. We will not need faith in heaven. What's the purpose of faith? Faith is that foundation. It's that, it's that solid ground. It's that cornerstone. We say that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And we say that He is the cornerstone. And that we build upon Him. Well, once we get to heaven, um, God has revealed it. So, Jesus is the perfect revelation of the Father. Jesus is the truth. When, when we are standing face to face with God, the truth, Jesus Christ, we will no longer need it to be revealed or even believe in it revealed because we will be face to face with our Lord. So faith is not necessary in heaven. Hope is also not necessary in heaven because what it, the, that which we have desired, eternal life, will now be completely within our grasp. And so faith and hope are not needed. Um, but they are needed now. They absolutely are needed in our, in our life right now, and we have to ask for these. And that's why it's important to pray um, the prayers that the church has given us. The act of faith, the act of hope, and the act of charity are extremely important because we need an increase in these so that we can do the holy will of God. 
What does Satan want us to do? Well, Satan's plan very clearly is to, as far as our desires are concerned, he wants one to disorder our desire. And every single seven deadly sin, every one of the seven deadly sins is actually a disordered desire. So we look at the desire for food. The, dis the disordered desire for food would be gluttony. We see for the desire to reproduce, for sexual, uh, sexual gratification, that, that, and, and to, to procreate, that would be um, you know, lust. And so you can go on and on. The, the desire, uh, the desire for self, you know, the desire to know ourself would be the disordered desire would be pride. So all of these, he wants to disorder our desire. He knows that as humans we have great desire, and he knows that that desire is directed towards God, and so he wants to direct it somewhere else. Um, the second thing is, if he can't disorder our desire, he wants us to have no desire. And this would be an example of sloth. And, and this, of course, leads to despair, and then despair even sometimes to even wanting to take our own life. Um, so this is what Satan will do in regards to our desire. What will he do in regards to truth? Well, two things. He'll make truth relative, which means I get to determine. It's subjective. Every person gets to determine what truth is. Well, we just ended up saying that Jesus is the tr way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is God. God is true. If I get to determine truth, then that means I'm God. In this case, we've, we have uh, really um, went against the first commandment, have no other gods before me. It's exactly what Satan would like. Or, really the second thing is, well, truth may be objective, but I don't care. In fact, I'm just going to become lukewarm. And it's this lukewarmness that Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, in Revelation says, those who are neither hot nor cold, who are lukewarm, will be spit out of my mouth. So we, we can't fall to the trap of, we, we can't allow Satan, who is the roaring lion, seeking to d destroy our souls, we can't allow him to steal our hope. To steal our hope by disordering our desires, or by allowing, our, our, I guess, tempting us to have no desire at all. We also can't allow him to destroy our faith. Um, by falling to rel rel um, maybe subjecting the truth and relativism. And also, um, we can't become lukewarm. We have to actually be zealous for the truth and follow the truth. Um, it's, it's really important that we do that. Um, kind of going one more, I guess, a little bit more with this, I, I want to talk a little bit about our soul and, and really how things were at the beginning in the garden with our soul. So if we look at, in the very beginning, Adam and Eve, um, they, they had the grace of God. They had a relationship with God. Um, they were one with God. So they had the grace. They had an intellect, just as we do. Um, their intellect was, was um, bright. It was uh, well, well, you know, being used well. And they had a will. Okay, so with this, they could think, of course, and they could act. Once they had committed the original sin, um, the intellect became darkened, and the will, um, really, the desire of the will became turned on self, so it became weak. Um, and there's, there's two words that I want to use here um, that actually, I, I think, really help with this, and they're, they're Latin words. Um, the first, I think we know pretty well in regards to the will, is con cupere. So, con cupere. And what this means is with, okay, con, but, but this with is a, a forceful with, like a, a, a strong push even. So, with um, desire. So, this word right here means desire. With desire. And we get from this word, concupere, we get um, con, uh, concupiscence. So you can see where concupiscence, concupere, with desire. And, and what happens, of course, before the fall, that the tendency was the will to, of course, be desired after God. After, we see that the desire is self, away from God. 
And so we have to train our will to, to go back to God and not to turn in on ourselves. What's going to help us with this is to have our desire for eternal life and the grace necessary to obtain it. So hope is ultimately what is going to help us help our will turn back to God and to act accordingly. We act according to our desires. Um, we have to really remember that. So if our desires are correct, then our, our actions will follow those desires. Um, the Latin word that we get with, with intellect is um, conscire. And this is where we get the word conscience. So we get concupiscence from this word, and then we get the word conscience from this. And, and conscience just really means this is with knowledge. Okay? With desire, with knowledge. So our intellect should be, of course, with the knowledge. <clears throat> but what kind of knowledge? Where are we going to get that knowledge? Well, we know that, that how is this going to happen? Through faith. So if this is with desire, this is with knowledge or with truth. And I'm acting not upon my own truth that I, that I get to determine, but I'm actually acting upon the truth, Jesus Christ. So in our life, when we talk about having a well-formed conscience with knowledge, we have to form our conscience with the truth. Jesus Christ, the truth, becomes our standard. He becomes our rule. And, and we judge everything on that. Um, our our uh, concupiscence, you know, our desire, we have to order our desires. And the true order of our desires is towards God, is towards this eternal life, which is what hope um, allows us to do. So as, as, we, as we struggle with having a formed conscience, and as we struggle with concupiscence, we have to realize that, you know, these words really just broken down mean to have a good knowledge and to have a good desire. To have a knowledge that's formed with truth and to have a desire that is ordered towards eternal life. Um, with all of this being said, I think we, we see how great a gift these virtues are. Faith, hope, and love. And that these virtues, if practiced and if we ask for them, um, and practice to a heroic degree will enable us, like James and John in the Gospel, to say, we can drink from this cup, and I will never let this cup go, no matter what. Just like Jesus in the garden, you know, I will not let this cup pass. Not my will, but your will be done. This cup will not pass. I will hold this cup, and whatever, Lord, you put in this cup, give me the strength, give me the grace, to drink it, and to drink it with joy, and to drink it with peace, and to be an example to all that I will meet um, of, of your holy will. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.